Okay, okay. What is What's that? <laughs> Do you guys have these messages typed in in advance, ready just to hit the button? <laughs> good morning, good morning. Hello, everybody. What do we got? Sunday morning here in Tokyo. I just made it in time to get this going here. It was a late night last night, so. <laughs> okay, what we've got today, what we've got today. You saw me yesterday, we worked on a bit of the carving. We worked on a bit of the carving of the uh, seaweed block, and we'll be continuing this today. I, I finished off pretty much one half of it. Today we'll be doing the other part, but it's a noisy clearing work first and then quiet clearing work. But I've got another more prior, higher priority job has come up this morning. Ishikawa-san is here this weekend, Saturday, yesterday, and Sunday, today. She's doing the test printing and first printing of the next subscription series print. I don't remember what month this is. It's, it's, it could be September, it could be October, I don't remember. September, probably, I guess. And you saw, actually, I was doing this on the stream a couple of weeks back. I did the color separations. I did the drawing of the color separations, pasted them down, and sent them away to Kawasaki and our printer. I did that on the stream. The blocks came back a few days ago, and Ishikawa-san has tested them up. She's been testing different colors. And those of you who were on the color separation stream a couple of weeks ago will remember what we did. This design has an area in the center, the skin tone of the, you know, is it a creature or hero or whatever? I don't know. The skin tone has an... It's, Jed has done it in two colors, which overlap to make a third color. But what he has done was, he's done it... Let me pop up the original. I must still be here from when I did this a few weeks ago. By the way, Dave, don't forget about the show and tell that you talked about yesterday. What was that going to be about? I've already forgotten about it. I don't know. Let me think about that for a few minutes. It's been kind of a busy day here. Let me just concentrate on this for a few minutes. When we did the color separations here. So here we are. This was Jed's Photoshop master. And the two blocks we're going to look at today, this morning, these are nothing to do with the gray, nothing to do with the maroon, the red parts. This is simply the blue and the green. It's the skin tone for the creature and the head for the smaller creature. Ah, Okada Yosho prints. Okay, okay. Uh, I don't know if I can do that. Well, it's just do we'll, we'll do that. And what Jed has done is he's, if you look at the chest of the creature, it's a sort of a green teal color in the center. And then at some edges of it, there's a bit of light green showing and some edges is a bit of a blue showing. So what we've done at this point is we first carved the entire skin area green, this block, and then Ishikawa-san has done a test printing. You can see where our carver has carved the entire skin area blue. So at the moment we have two blocks that are identical. They're just the same thing. And if we printed them both, we would get the medium green teal color that you see in the, in the print there. But what I've got to do now is we've got to decide which parts of these blocks have to be trimmed away. From the blue block, I've got to trim away some edges so that the green is exposed. And from the green block, I've got to trim away some parts so that the blue is exposed. So what she's given me is two test prints. She's given me some extra copies, so I've got extra to work with here. She's given me two test prints, and my job now is to look at Jed's original and draw the places that have to be cut away. I then will paste this stuff onto the wood, let it settle, and that'll tell me where I need to carve. So, it's a bit of drawing here. And it's really, really easy to get these things mixed up. So on the blue block, I have to cut away the parts that are going to show as the light green color in that original design from Jed. This little creature here, for example, he's got a light green rim light around the top of his head. Change my glasses here. And 
on his ear. And at the top of his nose. So there's three zones on the small creature. Down on the feet, there's a green showing at the top of the feet. This knee doesn't have one. This knee does have one. This hand does, it's got one at the top. There's none on the chest, one at the top here. right under the mouth. Okay, so we've delineated, we've shown the areas now that are going to be cut off this blue block to create those green rim lights. I think that's all of them. Now on the green block, we do it the other way around. We cut off the areas that we want the blue to show through. And it's basically a rim light from the other side, a shadow light, I guess. Jed's been consistent here. He's put one on one side of each area. This gives it the 3D modeling. Look at me, I'm an artist. I think that's it. Let's double check here. Okay, I think I've got them all. Now, 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 very, very important point here. I've got my two drawings now that need to be pasted on the block to guide the carving. But if I just get some glue now and paste these on, it'll be a disaster. And the reason is, this is an actual woodblock print. She printed this yesterday, and when she printed it, she did it with the paper in a moistened condition. 
So she moistened the paper before she started. The paper expanded. She did her printing on these blocks. This green was printed from this block right here, but the paper was moist. It's now shrunk down. And if I pasted this on, if I, we can probably check and see, if I just do a dry run here and try and look and see. Yeah, look at this. If you can see it, the eyes don't match at all because the paper is a sh smaller condition than it should be. <coughs> so before I can paste this down, I'm going to have to moisten these sheets and increase their size. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run back to the print party room for a minute. Let me pop this back off here. I'm going to just grab these two sheets. I'm going to run back to the print party room back there. And I'm going to quickly moisten these and slip them inside the package of paper waiting for this morning's print party. It'll take them a while to get sized, so I'll come back here, I'll do other work for a few minutes, then go back there, get the moistened sheets out, and we'll paste those down. So give me a second, I'm going to go run back to the print party room. Okay, we've got to give them 10 or 15 minutes to absorb their moisture, swell up. We can then paste them down here and get going. So for the moment, let's put these away. Okay, so in the interim, while we're waiting for that, it's going to be noisy, I'm sorry. So we're going to pick up what we did yesterday. Oh, there goes my garbage can. We're still under construction here. You know, my shelves that are going to go in here are not built yet, so I'm just surrounded by crap. Aoyama-san is, uh, you know, going to get busy on the next level of construction, but he's off in Hawaii with his family right now. He spent rather a lot of time here the past couple of months, and uh, his family is demanding a little more time from him. So, hope everything went well with your checkup the other day. I don't know. Well, I did all the checkups. They did all the tests and tests and bloods and scans and all that stuff, and I go back next Wednesday for the uh, results. This was just a scheduled, you know, I think it was one year. In Japan here... They're really, really strict on this. You know, I'm now actually officially a senior citizen here in Japan. And they're really, they've got a thing worked out for the medical tests. They want to catch stuff as early as possible. And this has been going on for years. When I became 60, you get the letter from the, from the city office, please go for this test, please do this, we'll pay for it, blah, 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 blah. And when I became 65 last year, the whole thing uh, leveled up. So I guess this must have started, when I was 65 last year, last summer, I went for this full body check. And now again, it's a year later, so here you are, the clock has ticked over. So, so the tests were last week, and I go to the, for the chat and discussion and come back next year, Mr. Bull, blah, 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 blah. Okay, where am I? I need our friend. And let's get the microphone again. Let's put the microphone up here as much out of the way as we can. Although, honestly speaking, that, that points it towards the roof. It might make it worse. I don't know. And let's do a bit of banging. You spelled it wrong.
Okay, are we ready? Here we go. No, change my glass. This wood over here is much softer. The other side was, the knot is in the middle. So this side's quite hard, and up here it's much softer. This really is not great wood. Well, we got...
grain is every which way is wrong here. You can see the way we do this, Nate. I've, yeah, I've used the chisel. I've got a groove around the outside of the, of the saved area. And I'll move to the noisier one. It's even, it's a wider chisel. I'm going to now come down to that groove from the outside. You can see the way it goes. The grain here, every way we go, it's wrong. It's really a sort of a flat piece of wood. You carve this way, it chips the grain. You carve this way, it chips the grain. So we'll try and get what we can. So I'll just bring this out now to about two or three fingers. Be one or two minutes more of banging and then I'll switch to the quieter chisels. Don't forget those sheets. Yeah, the other sheets there, they're moistening. It's okay, they can't, uh, it's not time sensitive. They, they can stay in there all day, it doesn't matter. The longer they stay in there, actually, the better the chance there is to get to a good smooth. If I take them out too soon, they'll be too small. So don't worry. I'll finish the noisy part of this first. Then I'll go get the sheets that are in the package. And I'll come back and do the quiet job here. So, so a couple more minutes of noise here. Sorry. We had a bit of a taste of this yesterday, you know, and our Ishikawa-san was working on that test printing for the Lude series. And there was one place where the block was too shallow, so she needed to cut it deeper. And I was busy in the shop, so she just came down and used my tools here, and she started tapping for a couple of minutes. And we couldn't function. The shop was just, people were all like, what's going on? What's that noise? What's that noise? What's that noise? And what I'm doing now is incredible. There's nobody else could function here if I was doing this. So clearly mixing a carving bench in a shop doesn't work. We know that. And I don't even think about ever doing work like this during off during hours when the shop is open. Okay, a couple minutes more. It's not.
and now we're against the grain. We have to come back around the other way. When you look at the blocks, you know, this last block that came from Kawasaki-san, our carver in Kobe, comparing her blocks with mine, you know, I can see she doesn't actually have a chisel like this. Her blocks are all the wide areas are showing little tiny marks. She must have chisels like this. And she's scooping out, scooping out, scooping out, scooping out. And you can see one after the other, small marks, small marks, small marks, small marks, small marks. There's no marks on her blocks left over from large chisels. And we've talked to her about this. You know, you could perhaps, you know, increase your, your productivity quite a bit by getting some larger chisels. And she's like, well, maybe I'll think about it, whatever. I think she's worried about noise. She lives in a Japanese house with neighbors nearby. And she's going to be paranoid about making noise for them. So she, her work takes a lot longer than it, than it really should. You know. It's like me, when I was back in Canada, before I ever came to Japan here, I was trying to make prints by myself. And we've still got, I've still got some of those old blocks. And they show, they show the same thing exactly as Kawasaki-san's blocks. A bunch of tiny chisel marks instead of some really major chisel marks. And I just didn't know. I didn't think about it. I didn't realize, you know, get efficient, blow away some wood. To do this with a small chisel would be incredible and crazy, crazy, crazy. Not seeing much conversation. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I didn't, didn't have a chance to watch both here. Okay, almost done. Just this last little bit here. Get this out of the way.
Okay, I think that'll do it. I think pretty much for the noisy stuff here this morning. Let me get a couple more times here. It's not finished. All this stuff here will later have to come up, but that's rock hard wood. That's going to be extremely noisy. There's no way I need to abuse you guys with that. So let's just get a couple more times. That gives me enough to go on. Okay, Mr. Persuader can go away for the day. That's the end of the noise, gang. Thanks so much for your patience putting up with that. get those moist sheets now what I should do I can't just bring them back in the room or they'll dry out while I'm walking back down the room here so let me get ready for them I've got my glue what I'll do is I'll just bring the whole pack I'll put it here I guess let's see maybe maybe make room somewhere zoom out a bit just a sec Okay, let's go get the paper. Back in a minute. Here's where I screw up. I put the blue one onto the green and the green one onto the blue, right? Okay, microphone. <coughs> I did, look at that, wood went right into my coffee. It's moist enough. Let's give a quick test here. If I screw this up, you know, it's no good. So this paper should be moist enough. Let's see. Get my glasses. Let's do a quick test before I try gluing it down. This is green and green. And yeah, the eyes line up. We've done it. So just that few minutes of moistening, the paper has now expanded, it's ready to be pasted down. And this, this part's always critical, you know, if I screw this part up, if any of us, if we get the paper the slightest bit off, then the cut lines are in the wrong place. Okay, check, blue, green, check, green, blue, high, okay. I 
what I forgot to do, I'm sorry, I forgot to bring a baron. I've got to tack this down carefully if I, without pressing. Let me take another trip back to the party room. Sorry about that. I've got to get a baron to put this paper down so we get a shot. You're gently, no stress in this way. Next, this has got its own check to see if we do have the expansion right, the paper, you know, it should be in the right place. The green should show through in the green block. That looks like we've got it right there. I do believe we're okay. Move it down now. Okay, they're safely pasted down.
got to wait. If I rub it now, it's going to slide. I've got to let it shrink. Let, let it dry. Okay, I'm sorry, I've been missing some of these questions or stuff. Whoa, 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 where are we? Not sure if there's any questions I can answer here. We were talking about show and tell. I kind of missed that up. I know I can do this maybe. I wish I should wait a bit more so this dries out a bit. I know. When I was talking about the show and tell, what did I'm doing? I'm trying to get ready for the next YouTube video. There's just been so much going on. I can't get my head clear. I've got a script ready for the next YouTube video. I've been gathering prints and stuff ready to talk about it. And as part of the gathering the prints together, I got I brought from Ome a set of prints. It's the first set of prints I ever bought. It was when I was traveling here in Japan in the late 1970s. And that's what we were blabbing about the other day, the Okada Yoshio prints. Anyway, last night what we did was, I don't know, I don't know, it's too big. Let me try and get the file. It's, it's too big for this desk, you know. Let me try and get the file. This might not work. because These prints are big and the file is big. Get rid of the cups and stuff here. Let me just try. Let's see. I gotta wait for that thing to dry anyway. So let me go get the file and see what I can show you. Hang on a second. This is not the best place to do this. It's so tight for space here. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, two files here. This is the object. I, in 1970, I guess, I was on our first trip to Japan. The, my girlfriend and I, my partner and I at that time, Japanese girl. We were traveling in Japan for three months. I had made a couple of test prints. Not They weren't test prints. I had made a couple of woodblock prints as sort of, you know, uh, just, just as hobby material to try. And I'd been getting, interesting, getting interested in it bit by bit and I wanted to make some, some more. So we came to Japan for a three-month trip, her and I, just to see her family, travel around, do this and do that. And this will all be told more carefully in the next YouTube video, but we visited a department store to get out of the rain one day, and there was a display of prints, and this particular set was in there. Uh, it says, Genji, Genji Emaki Okada Yoshio. I couldn't read that at this time, whatever. I just I saw the display of the prints. Now what I've done here, this is the original packaging, but the original packaging for many of these Showa-era prints is no good for long-term storage of the prints. I bought this in 1979, and by the time 20 or 25 years had passed, some of the prints were starting to get foxed because the packaging is too tight, it's airtight, no air can go in, and the paper they used was not acid-free paper. So what this is at the moment, this is just an empty package. I've taken the prints out of it. And we do that now with most of the prints that we get that we are keeping for long-term storage. We put them in a more... Uh, package that's more suitable for long-term preservation. Now, I don't know how on earth I'm going to turn the pages for this. This is a, a big file. Anyway, let me show you these four prints. Uh, I've, here we are. Let me get them out. 
this was the first woodblock print I purchased ever. It's designed by Okari Yoshio and it's depicting one of the characters in the Tale of Genji series. And it's one of the most astonishing productions of the 20th century, I think. I'll try and get some light on it here for you to see. I have no idea offhand how many impressions are on this print. First guess without going back to the blocks and looking at them would be about 50, 50 to 60 impressions. Even things like these gradations, of course, that are on these wall hangings, these are all done. You look at this gradation, 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 gradation. It's an absolute insane amount of work. For the background here, they've done these tones. This is not just random. They've carved multiple overlaid blocks to give all these striped and deep background tones. Even things like the guy's hat is done with a gradation. I don't know if you can see it here. The hat is a deep, dark, rich black tone, but it lightens out just at the very bottom edge. This is insanely difficult to do. And of course, at the bottom, they've done both. They've done a carved block gradation with stripes, and then they've put a natural gradation on top of it. And fireflies. Her name, the character's name, this woman in the Genji tale is Hotaru. And she gets this moniker because the scene that she is in is where the hero, Genji, meets her. And she's illuminated only by the light of fireflies. And to do light surrounded by dark for us is extremely difficult. Remember, we don't print light colors. Light is what's left when you surround it with dark. So this has been done with multiple blocks. There's a white space left, a gray block around it, a darker block around that, and the, f the print printer has feathered this with his finger to give it a blurred effect around each of these light. Top quality paper. And look at this. There's This is a semi-transparent screen, of course, that falls in front of her. So to give the illusion of transparency on this screen. Her kimono color is printed in a fairly solid standard color here, but as the kimono passes under the screen, it's of course now a different wood block and it's prepared with the same pigment, but mixed in a lighter shade to give the illusion of transparency. And this is insanely difficult to get them all at the same illusory level. I'm not sure if he's 100% succeeded in this, but you get the idea. If you goof up and get dark, lighter, dark, lighter, dark, not too light, then the illusion of a single piece of transparent fa fa fabric is lost. Same thing here. Yeah? It's the dark background and they've lightened it up as these transparent pieces of fabric fall across it. The story behind the thing, it's these are four images from a set. The Genji book itself, the thing that we call Tale of Genji, written by Murasaki Shikibu back in, I don't know, 1200 years ago. It's in what they say, I think it's 54 or 57 chapters, I can't remember. I'm an idiot, I can't remember. And these are the illustrations for four of the chapters. And it's a bit of a tragic story. What happened was Okada-san got the contract from the Yomiuri newspaper to illustrate the story every Sunday in the newspaper. A famous author, Tanabe Seiko, had been hired to give episodic, you know, to translate it into modern Japanese, one episode every Sunday, and Okada-san got the job to do the illustrations for it. So Tanabe Seiko and Okada Yoshio worked through the year producing an illustration for each chapter. And they weren't gorgeous full-color illustrations like this. They were uh, color washes with minimal number of colors to print in the Sunday newspaper. And while it was going on, or at the end of it, one of the print publishers in town, Yu Yu Do, whose mark you see here, this is the Yu Yu Do mark, he, they talked to Okada-san about turning the whole thing into a 57 set of fabulous woodblock prints. Only four of them came into existence. I, know I can't tell too much of the backstory. There was so much stress between the designer and the publisher about how much to invest in the prints and how much detail was necessary. There was so much stress there, they called it a day after four. Only four prints were published. 
but they are prints to die for. They are prints to die for. I don't even know where to start, it's just whatever. It's the kind of stuff that we didn't really think would ever be produced in the 20th century, but uh, they just went ahead and did it. Money, 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 money. They spent a fortune on this. They're very stylized, you know, this long hair stuff. Did the women back then really have hair this long? We don't know. It became an artistic convention just to draw their hair so long it disappeared off the edges of the paper. That's not an invention of Okada-san. That comes back from, from way, way back. The kimono patterns are done with a gold-colored pigment on those curly parts of it. This is the character they called Akashi in the, in the book, in the novel. We've got two copies of this. I know as other copies have come available, I've bought them where I can see them. And you can see a very interesting thing here. How well you take care of your prints and how you hold them and what kind of environment you store them in is so important. And look at these two. Two prints from the same print run, from the same blocks, the same printer, same pigments, same everything. It's a vermilion pigment, and vermilion, I think, is a sulfuretted mercury, I think is the, is the chemical terminology, and it oxidizes. And if you have your pigment available to the air with a certain specific humidity, temperature, environment, it'll oxidize like crazy. And this one has been carefully preserved and kept away from the air quite a bit, not exposed. And this, this is the one I bought years and years and years ago, and it's oxidized like crazy. The publisher, Ano Yuido, they had two of the prints made down in Kyoto and two of the prints made in, uh, in Tokyo. This must be one of the Kyoto ones, Matsuda-san, he's a carver down in Kyoto. two of each of these. The other ones in the set, I just have one of each. I know I've, I've got some other copies, but they're just two that decayed, two pops. Let's have a look. Here we go. This one is perhaps the least attractive of the series. The woman is pretty, uh, I don't know, she looks evil. I don't know the background inside the novel itself. This is the one they call Wakana. And Okara-san style, you know, he draws his women with these very uh, semi-erotic, semi-evil eye angles, very narrow eyes. You either find it attractive or you don't find it attractive. And again, we have the same thing. We have light in a dark room and it's really, really, really difficult to do in woodblock prints. Obviously, they've cut away the flame. There's a bit of a pink inside the flame. And some of the rest is done with smudging with your finger as you're printing the dark background colors. And it's very, very difficult to get them all the same. And again, the hair, the hair, the hair. And this hair is not done with one block. I, I, it's done with many, many blocks. And I've heard from both the people involved in this, Okada-san and the publisher, that the hair on these blocks was the major sticking point between them as far as uh, having trouble with the production of these. They had originally carved the blocks to match Okada-san's sketches as they appeared in the newspaper, but it turned out that he felt there wasn't enough hair, there wasn't enough drama, so he asked them to carve some more blocks. So they did. They carved another block or two to add more hair. He came back and said, no, that's the wrong place. Let's do it again here. They carved another block. He said, no, let's do more hair. And at some point there was an explosion. And that's it. The two of them were not able to continue. So we only have four prints in existence. About what could theoretically have been 50, 50 prints, more than 50 prints. This was back in the bubble time. There was money everywhere. And this one, this is the one to me that makes the set. This is the print called Matsukaze. And here she is. <laughs> 70s 
simple and effective. And here and here and here. So, who needs octopuses? Nay, no joke. Who needs octopuses? That's another side light to this story. I'll be talking about this when I make the video. In the, it's it's kind of unbelievable. When I mention this to a couple of staff, they're like they're stunned, staggered when I when I tell them what happens next on this. The wood blocks to make this set of four prints. I I own the wood blocks for this set of prints. The publication ran its course back in 1979. No, no, 77. I think these were published. I met them in 1979. I became friends with the man who published these, Saeki-san, over the years, and also with Okada-san, the designer of these. And the story itself, we'll talk about this in a video, but at the end of it all, the blocks were there, the project was not going to continue, and instead of throwing away the blocks, it turned out that uh, I was able to receive them. And the blocks for this set are now sitting in my Ome warehouse, my basement. There's no painting here. This is the bare paper. What they've done, it's possible sometimes that when they do a skin tone on a woman, we do printing. On the Kuchie I made, we did the same thing. We printed a very pale tone to create the skin. Their decision on this one was to go with the empty paper. So what you're seeing as, as skin tone here is just the empty paper. They've done lipstick, of course, and there's a faint, 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 I don't know if we're going to be able to see it. There is a tone just above her eye. This is not the best copy. I've seen now three copies of this, two of them heavily foxed in this one. And you can see some stories here about the blocks. Look at this. Can you see it? The black lines here don't quite match. The registration is not what it should be. Can I see it here? I'm backwards on the screen. The black lines should disappear behind there, but they don't. A couple of other places, they overlap a little bit too far. The registration on this one's a little bit off. And if you see the blocks, you understand why. These are not plywood blocks. These are real, natural cherry blocks. They are huge. And the number of blocks to produce this here, as I said, it's not one or two. There's at least 10 different blocks coming together to create, create this tangle of hair. And getting them all lined up when they are shrinking and expanding and shrinking and expanding is not, not, it's very, very, very difficult. I said I've got the blocks, that's possession of the physical pieces of wood. That doesn't give me any rights in the image whatsoever. Whatsoever. I can't grab the blocks, make prints from them, and sell them in this shop. Even if the blocks turned out to be in usable condition. I got them from Okada-san. He gave them to me because he knew we were interested in preserving that sort of thing and for studying them. The blocks do not come with any rights to produce the image. The image rights, of course, it's the copyright is held by the artist. And in Japan, the rule is death plus 50, currently changing to death plus 70. And Okada-san is still alive. So to produce prints from that block set needs one of two things to happen. We talk to him and get permission, get him involved in the project, or we wait one till he dies, and then two, 70 more years. And then those blocks could be used to make prints for sale. I don't think I'll be doing that. The print set is called Genji Emaki. Genji is from the tale of Genji. It's the name of the hero of the novel. And Emaki, Emaki Mono is the name of the old scrolls. They were E, picture, Maki, round. So they're using a bit of a poetic terminology for this one by calling it Genji Emaki. It's a picture scroll from the tale of Genji, but it's not a scroll and there's only four images. Anyway, the next video we'll be talking about this thing and showing them and showing the blocks and all that kind of stuff. Well, right now, I have yet to do some actual work. Where's that little block we pasted down a few minutes ago? Anybody see where it went? Oh, here it is. Oh, 
Okay, let's do some work. Again, I'm sorry if there were questions coming by when that was on. I didn't, uh, I couldn't actually see. Is it possible to restore the oxidization on that print? I don't think so. I'm not knowledgeable or expert about restoration of these things at all. I mean, people who work in the museums and stuff like that, they have lots and lots of knowledge about this. My knowledge is just here on the ground. I have no access to, to x-ray machines and stuff like this. I don't know much about that at all. We know quite a bit about taking care of the prints, but once they become damaged, there's not really anything that, that I know about. You know, I'm not a restorer. I don't see a bunch of questions here. So are the sleeves, we're, they're in a, a kind of a mylar plastic sheet. I don't know the exact chemical composition on these things. I've been using these kind of files now for more oh, 30, 35 years. And there's a bit of, it's not guaranteed. You know, there's a bit of question that they may be leaching chemicals into the paper or what, I don't know. For me, it's the lesser of the evils. The kind of paper and packaging that they're stored in, all those Showa era prints, it's fatal to prints. Number one for us, get them out of those packages. The packages are not acid free paper. The paper prints are glued in sometimes. There's no air access. So number one for us, just get them out of those, those current packages. Two, what am I gonna do with them? We've got prints. This is our safest way of storing them. Something that we know is not actually damaging them and we get them out and air them out as much as we can. And when we do establish our little museum thing, work on a gallery museum upstairs, the staff members will have a rotation system where all the prints do have to get aired out every few months. So is this the best way to store prints? I don't know. It's the lesser of the evils that are available to us rather than having them just stacked on shelves. The prints have got to come out of that show air packaging. This is not gumpy paper. It's not going to peel off like the, the gumpy we see and, and use in our daily work. This is actually a printing washi, so there's quite a thick back on this. And I've got to be careful to pull this away. To try and find the lines I drew. See any of my lines here that I drew? What's what's going on? I think it's a long sheet. Did I count those were tests? This is the blue one, right? Which means it's cut away to expose that green rim light. Where are those things? So this should have lines. Why can't I see the lines that I drew? There they are, okay.
Jacques is here this morning, is he? Just looking at those prints. <laughs> Any idea when your Okadayosho YouTube video will be released, Dave? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. At the moment for me now, it's just day by day, minute by minute, jobs like this that just come roaring up. Most of my work now is simply trying to produce work and produce jobs for the rest of the staff. It's, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm the, what they call it, the Japanese word is neck. I'm the neck here, as in bottleneck. Everybody else's work at some point comes through me and comes over my desk and comes around. And if I don't get to it straight away, then they can't continue with their stuff. And that's the problem, like this one I'm doing right now. It's not something I should be doing. But here we are, you know, nobody else can do this. So I don't know Jacques, and I'm sorry. I know. It's coming, that's all I can say, it's coming. I know. You're nice to hear from me, Jacques. I haven't heard from me for a while, so. Is this the foot below the sword? Okay, feet are done, leg is done, other leg is not, the face is done. What's next? The green rim light. It's on the ears. I guess not very clear for you guys to see what's going on, whatever. If you saw the first part of the process this evening, you'll understand what this is about. But, uh, 
we're trimming off part of a blue block to leave exposed color underneath at the time of printing later. So. Then the hand, the hand on the sword has a ring light at the top. On the other hand, yep. Then biceps, this bicep has nothing. And this one has the cut under the arm. Okay, that's it for this one.
Louis Carlson also left me a couple of notes. She's got a couple of places. She thinks it's too low here, too high. I mean, she wants it trimmed here, and she wants this trimmed away. She's coming this morning to do the to work on the printing on this one, so I've got to get this done right away. We're working with our just-in-time system here. That's the way our subscription prints always seem to end up. We start months and months in advance, but by the time we get to the late summer and autumn, the subscription prints are running neck and neck with the delivery dates. And this is part of the question Jed and I are discussing what to do about a subscription series for next year. And some ideas are on the table, some quite complex ideas. And Jed loves thinking about complex prints and stuff. He wants to make, you know, spectacular work. But the more complex they get and the more difficult they get, the more I have to really be concerned about the, the delivery. You know, we have to make these things. When there's no deadlines involved, it's okay. We just take the time that's necessary to make them. That's fine. But a subscription series is different. A subscription series has to be ready every month. And some of the proposals, the kind of things that Jed is showing me, I'm, I'm not so confident that I'm going to be able to deliver once a month. So he and I are still at the moment wrestling with what to do for next year's series. We've got a wonderful proposal, a wonderful concept for what could be a great series. And he's a little... You know, I'm not, he's not upset with me yet, but I mean, he's a little bit, you know, he seems to think I'm not so excited about it. And of course, I'm, I'm hesitant because of the question of making 12 prints of such complexity on schedule. There's also the other non-trivial question that as we increase the complexity of the prints, Boys are here, I guess, oh, 920, so, so, so. I didn't know that, no. As we increase the complexity of the prints, of course the price has to go up. So last year's subscription series was extremely inexpensive, $25 a month. But this proposal that Jed and I are working on is going to be, it would have to be quite a bit more than that. So. But we have to make up our minds real soon, because sometime within August at the latest, the thing has to be decided, wrapped up, the policy's done, first bunch of designs ready by August. And at the moment, we're talking about this project, but I don't have a backup plan. I think that's part of Jed's, Jed's uh, thinking. Just keep talking about this one, keep talking about this one to the point where it's gone so late that even if I said no, I don't have plan B. So. <laughs> That's kawaii -san. He opened the shutter. He's head upstairs to put his backpack and stuff in the lunchroom up there. He'll be down in a minute. Is there a history of subscriptions in woodblock prints? There is actually. I didn't know this when I first started doing mine. I thought I was changing the world by creating a new idea when I did my subscriptions in the, in the Poet series. But back in the Taisho era and also in the Showa era, some publishers did do this. They booked people to get a regular print or a pair of prints once a month and stuff. So yes, it's not something that I invented out of, out of whole cloth. I know Paul Jacolet also, he sold prints by subscription, using the same word subscription, but in a different sense. What Paul Jacolet did in the 1950s and, and when he was doing his prints, selling to the American GIs and stuff, he would collect subscribers for an individual print. He would have a, a project he wanted to make of quite a large spectacular print and before embarking on production of that print he would pre-sell it and he, he talked about that hello Koizamizan hello he talked about that as subscriptions so please subscribe to this print he collected the number of people who are pre-ordering it it's kind of like what we do these days with a kickstarter campaign 
but he, and the, the terminology he used was subscription. Please purchase this print by subscription. And if you go back way in time, if you go back to England in whatever it was, the 17, 1600, 1700s, a number of books and larger projects were done that way. Some of the early dictionaries and stuff like that, I forget the guy's name, the famous English writer. He was writing his dictionaries and he did them by subscription. He collected money in advance so that he could make the darn thing and then everybody who had subscribed in advance got a copy of the book. And I think actually that's the origin of the word subscription, I believe. I'm not quite sure. Another option on the table is to have it not monthly. If we're doing larger, uh, not larger, but more expensive prints, maybe not every month. Maybe we do a set of six prints and they go every two months. And Jed is not so excited about that because he wants, he needs income. I mean, he's got a family, four kids. He's got to feed his kids. Hello, Kalei san. Hello. So if we, for example, we have a $25 a month print this year, if we went to say a $40 print, but only did six of them, his income would drop. So Jed's thinking about this, you know, as a way to make a living, of course, you know. Kwai-san, kami koku ni arimasu ne, gomen. Boku wa ano, jibun no kami shimeshita, kono naka ni shimeshita nasu kara. Gomen, thank you. Aomari chan wa shi nakatte. Okay, there's the blue block from one of the pair. Yeah, before, if you've just come into it, we've got two blocks, blue and green. They were identical when we started this morning. The blue one has some portions cut off along the upper edges of many of the places, so green will show through. Switching to the green block, we are now going to trim some places, usually at the lower edge of the things, where the blue will show through. So the question about subscribers, if, if the income would drop, it's all a balance. It's a question of what the subscription price is and how many people we have. This year with the Loot Series, the idea had been to drop the price as low as we could possibly do it and pick up a ton more subscribers. And that didn't happen because the, the series is kind of fun, but it's not so dynamically fun that it took over the whole world and went viral. So the price went down and the number of subscribers didn't really change much, stayed about the same. So our subscription income, that graph I showed you the other day, our subscription income has fallen dramatically as a percentage of our income for the last year. And Jed's income has fallen. So nothing to do with being greedy or whatever, we would like to get it get it back to a steady level. Jed, of course, he wants to make a living off this. So. And for him, I don't have access to his income figures, but he's got the comic conventions, he's got online sales, and he's got subscriptions. I guess that's probably his main three sources of income. And if subscriptions fall, then, then you know, he's got to think of something else to do. Anyway, I've rambled on and on. It's been a bit, a bit of a mixed stream today. I'm sorry, Anthony. What we are now. Now, today's Sunday. The shop is going to be, we hope, quite a busy Sunday. Last night, we did a bit. Those of you who have been following the stream, I did stay open last night. And the pattern did get broken. The people who purchased prints last night did so in the 7 to 8 o'clock time and 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock time. After 9 o'clock, even though I stayed here working on my computer and stuff, nothing happened after 9 o'clock. So we'll see. We're, we're collecting evidence bit by bit by bit to see what are our best hours for probably keeping this shop open. Right now I've got to do this, but I've also got to get back to the shop here to get started on the first, first print party. So I'll sign off now. Ah, okay, okay. Hi, hi. I'll sign off now. Uh, this, there will be a stream tomorrow. Today is Sunday. Monday will be the, the ending of my week. I'm not sure what job I'll be doing. Perhaps banging away more on that octopus, octopus block. Uh, I don't really know. I'll be here. Same time. Same space tomorrow. Oh, I know. It might be a sizing stream upstairs. The sizing calendar is getting full. The girls need lots more paper. 
That might be where we're at tomorrow morning. Upstairs sizing. We'll see. I'll decide then. Thanks very much. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Thanks for watching this bit of a mixed up dream today. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs>